two different areas because our bottom function changes. So our top function is the same the whole time. The bottom function changes. We have both bottom functions written down. Y equals 0 is 1, and the other one is y equals x minus 2. So we got both bottom functions. We're just going to set up this integral. And the x coordinate we're going to partition on is pretty clear that it's 2. So we're going to go 0 to 2, 2 to 4. That's how we're splitting this up. So we got area 1 plus area 2. Integral area 1 goes 0 to 2. I'm just going to write big minus small plus integral 2 to 4, big minus small. Now these are different bigs and different smalls because it's for each of uh, the two different regions. So we'll do the first one. The first one's area 1. What is our big function from 0 to 2? I don't care about the right half of this. We're on the left half right now. So what is our, maybe I zoomed in too far. So we're on this left half. What's our big function? It's a little bit covered up. Square root x. Square root x. And then our little function, 0. And these are, we're doing a dx uh, integral. So these should be functions of x right here. So we got square root x, and 0 is a function of x. It's a boring function of x, the constant function of x. So we're doing square root x minus 0. And this is dx plus integral 2 to 4, big minus small. So we're on the right half now. So we're in the right half of this region. What is our big function? It's our big function. I want to know which, what's at the top of this region here. Oh, uh, Too many brain cells. Two, two X, so we got two functions. Squared X on the top is the big, <laughs> and the small is the X minus 2. Yes. That's so we got top minus bottom, or big minus small. The reason I'm using big minus small, in a minute, we're going to actually integrate this a different way. So we're going to turn our head sideways and integrate it the other way. Normally, it's top minus bottom. Unless you're going to go sideways, then it's going to be something slightly different. All right, so big minus small, square root x minus x minus 2. This is not a time to mess up your parentheses. So make sure you're actually subtracting the whole function. So you're subtracting the x minus 2 function, so make sure you subtract that whole x minus 2. This is not a difficult antiderivative. You're basically just doing the anti-power rule. So I'm not going to go ahead and figure this one out. So I'm going to write dot, 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 which means I expect you to be able to finish this at home relatively quickly. So we just found the area by cutting it into two pieces. We can <coughs> find the area a slightly different way. And what we're going to do is change our perspective. So we just integrated basically from 0 to 4 by figuring out what do cross sections look like. So if I laid out a few cross sections, we basically just figured out if we go across uh, what the area is this, in this manner. So what we're going to do right now instead I can undo this. Actually, we'll just erase the whole inside. So we're going to do the same area, but we're going to change perspectives. And I want to think about cross sections that look like this. So instead of sweeping left to right, we're going to go with horizontal cross sections and sweep top to bottom. So I need to figure out. We have two bounds. There's a big and a small. So the weird thing is now the big is on the left. Those are the, where the big x values are. And the wait, at the point that the big x values are this direction, and the small x values are that direction. So big ones are on the right, small ones are on the left.
So it's not top and bottom. They both have the same Y coordinate, but it's left and right now. So I'm going to do this uh, integral in the green marker to separate it from everything we did in the blue and the black marker. And I'll do all this work over here. So we're using horizontal cross sections. You really only have two choices. You can either go vertical cross sections, which is the way we've done every problem, except I didn't mention it before. You can go vertical cross sections, which will give you a dx integral, or you can do horizontal cross sections. And if we think about this, think about this as a windshield wiper. How do I sweep out all this area? I change my y coordinate up and down. So I'm going to change my y coordinate. The small, what is the smallest y coordinate I'm going to use? Zero. And what's the biggest y coordinate we're going to use? Two. So we're thinking of y coordinates. So I'm basically traversing the y axis from zero to two. So we're using horizontal cross sections. Our y is now between zero and two. Before, our x went from zero to four. That was when we were doing horizontals. So now we're thinking about our y changing from zero to two. Our cross section is very thin. Obviously, I drew it as it was just a line. So the thickness of that, we call that dy. So this is going to be a dy integral. So horizontal cross sections, we know our y uh, bounds. And we have a dy integral. So all of our variables need to be y's now, not x's. So I'm going to use the letter H for the width of this. I'm using H to normally stand for the height, but I'm just using it um, so we can think of height even though it's really a sideways height. Before it was actually a vertical height. So I need an H of Y function, which will be the height of the cross section. Or maybe I should write it as the width of the cross section. And it's still big. Now big is a function of y minus small. Is going to be also be a function of y. The problem with our two functions, the way they're written, is they're written as functions of x, not functions of y. So let's start with the easier function, y equals square root x. I need to change this into a function of y, not a function of x. So all you need to do is solve for x. So we're going to take this function right here. I don't need these a1, a2 anymore. That's not, we're not splitting it up like that anymore. So how do I solve for x? Pretty easy, square both sides. Now. I have x written as a function of y. This is this our this is going to be our small function right here. So that's our small function of y. So our small function of y is going to be y squared. That's our small function. Now I have the other, I have the big equation, but I need to turn it into a function of y. It's written as a function of x. All I need to do is solve for x. It's easy to do. Add 2 to both sides. So we have x equal y plus 2. And this is our uh, big function of y. So that's our big y function is y plus 2. And 
all we need to do to find the area we're going to integrate 0 to 2 we already figured that out you can see on the y-axis 0 to 2 and it's going to be big minus small which is our h of y function and this is a dy integral so you could find the area by turning your head sideways and computing the area by cross doing cross sections horizontally and we avoid the problem of having to split it into two regions because if you look the entire time we got one big function right there no problem and there's a small function it's the same functions the entire region I didn't have to split it up I did have to go and solve for X but that wasn't really too difficult to do and I think that integral is a little bit easier than not that the other two are difficult but that one's a tiny bit faster than getting the other two you should get the exact same number if I integrate this first integral it should be the same value as these two added together down here so some problems might be easier to do a dy integral instead of a dx just depends on the problem so any questions on this dy integral right here so when can you go dy integral pretty much any time you want except there's some times where it's not great to go dy instead of dx so I'm going to scroll up above and look at some of our other problems we did looking at this problem I could go dy but I would have to partition the space up right here because I have a different function on the left happening so here I would actually make it worse if I did a dy integral I'd have two different regions because my small function is one function up there and is a different function down there so I have to split this one up so I would not recommend going dy in this problem on this particular region it would probably take longer but still could be done we didn't graph any of those so I can't point to a graph if you did this right here this one might be extra tricky if you think about dy so here's what one dy would look like but I have to switch here so here's another cross section this particular one I would have to partition it in two different places so I'd have three pieces to figure out so this would be a really bad one to go dy so there are plenty of times where dy integral would be worse than a dx integral it all depends on the way your region is shaped. Now we're going to jump back into chapter four, which was all applications of derivatives. I'll do a really fast review of what we've done so far. Critical points are any point where your derivative is horizontal or where your derivative is zero. So it's the point on the graph that has that property. So that's a critical point. 
you find them by setting your derivative equal to zero, and then all those x values that make it zero are the x values of the coordinates, and you have to go and find the different y values. And that's how you get the points. And there's three types you classify them into. We got minimum, local minimum, local maximum, and neither. So the best way to determine local minimum was this right here. Take your second derivative. If your second derivative is positive, that means your function's happy, concave up, and we call that local minimum. If your second derivative is, let's see, positive right here, whoa, happy function's a minimum, so your second derivative is positive. If your second derivative is negative, you have a sad function, which actually is a local maximum. So that's what a sad function looks like. Inflection means your second derivative is not positive, not negative. The only thing left is, well, assuming your second derivative, your derivative exists, the only other choice is the second derivative is zero. And what happens then? You either have a horizontal, a flat function, or a function that goes from decreasing to decreasing, or from increasing to increasing. So you only stop for one moment and have a horizontal derivative. So those are what inflection points look like. I don't think we, we found some critical, so here we found some critical points. All that was boring, we had only one critical point. So let's do an example that has more than one critical. Uh, it's chapter four. It's not any section in particular. It's all the sections. You're going to use critical points all of chapter four. So our function, actually the fourth minus four x cubed plus 10. So how do we find critical points? How do we find critical points? Yeah, find derivative, set it equal to 0. So step 1, find f prime of x and set it equal to 0. So it's polynomial, just do power rule. factor out more. All right, any questions on derivative or x values that make it zero? If you have a polynomial, the best thing to do is solve for zero. Well, if you're setting the derivative equal to zero, you're already solved for zero, but you want to factor and then figure out using the zero product property what is uh, zero. All right, we have to classify now. How do we classify? You have to find the second derivative. So we found the first derivative. Let's figure out f double prime. 
So I'm looking off my derivative, which is written over here. So I have 12x squared minus 24x. And we're going to use this to classify 0 and 3. So I'll move 3 over. So f double prime of 0, we got 0 minus 0, which is 0. And what that is, that's not happy, it's not sad. So that's inflection point. But I still need to figure out the y coordinate of this point on the graph. So we're going to take uh, 0 and plug it into the original f. So we need to figure out where this y value would be. So we're finding the y value by just plugging in 0 into f. And this polynomial will give us 10. So we have an inflection point at 0, 10. So I want you right now to classify x equals 3. So you got to tell me, is it? Uh, positive, negative, second derivative, or zero, and then what does that mean? Your choice is local min, local max, or inflection point. Now, I don't care about the exact number you get when you plug this in. What I do care about is the value positive, negative, or 0. So whatever, I mean, I can compute this out. I'm just being intentionally lazy. All I had to do is figure out, is this value positive or negative? So it's 12 times, I mean, it's just 3 in here. But the fact that it's positive 36 versus positive any other number doesn't matter. Uh, it's positive, so I have a local minimum. And I recommend when you see positive, you draw a happy face, because a lot of times you're going to think positive, ah, that means maximum, which in fact means the opposite. So we have a local minimum, and figure out the y value. So I know 3 is the x value, we need to figure out the y value. If you're good at arithmetic, you don't need to do so much algebra. If you're bad at arithmetic, you can avoid a lot of problems doing using algebra. You're plugging into the original equation, right? Yes. Yeah. So if I plugged into the derivative, I would get 0. And if I plugged into the second derivative, I would get that same number I got before. So you don't want to plug into the derivative or the second derivative, because you've already, you already have used those uh, values. All right, so that is classifying critical points. The next thing we're going to do is sketch graphs. And we're going to sketch them a lot more precisely than we were able to do in pre-calculus class. So way back in pre-calculus class, we had n behavior. 
we had X intercepts, and that's pretty much it. And then we used bouncing and crossing to determine what it looked like. So what we know now is we know about how the slope looks and how the slope changes. And we're going to use those two properties to draw much better graphs. So I'm going to write down the graphing procedure. You are going to have to follow this procedure in the future. However, I will write down all eight uh, steps on your final exam or your quiz. So you'll see what the eight steps are. You'll have to know, know how to do each of the eight steps, but you won't have to memorize, oh, well, I only can think of six of the eight steps, so I'll write the eight steps down for you. You have to know how to actually go through and uh, you know, figure out each of the steps. So step one, so you got to know the domain. I'm not going to write all the detailed rules. You've been finding domains since the beginning of this quarter, and you found them back in pre-cal one as well. Don't divide by zero, square roots of, uh, don't do square roots of negatives. And we don't do logarithms, so you don't have to worry about uh, their domains. So find the domain and write it down, obviously. And optional, find symmetry. So if you find symmetry, you can, if you know your function is even, you can graph half of it and then use symmetry and then get the other half of the graph. So step two, we're going to look at uh, asymptotes, horizontal and vertical. Now horizontal, this is really end behavior. You're going to take limits going to infinity and negative infinity. So that's how we did horizontal, that's how we found horizontal asymptotes. And no matter which of those you're finding, every asymptote needs to come with a limit. So every asymptote you show me, you also need to have a limit written down. And this comes from chapter three. I think it was the last section in chapter three. It was basically called asymptotes. And we did this procedure. So we're going to find asymptotes, uh, find the derivatives. And step four, we're going to find and classify critical points. which obviously uses your derivative and your second derivative. Your first derivative finds them, your second derivative classifies them. So step five, we're gonna find intervals of increase and decrease. And we're going to look at the first derivative and figure out when's first derivative greater than zero. All those intervals, there may be more than one. That will be the intervals of increase. And when your, sec your derivative is negative, that'll be intervals of decrease. Step six, we're going to find concavity intervals. So find intervals. And I'm going to be a little more detailed on these because we haven't found these yet, so let's hold off on writing the next. I'm going to write a little more details here. So your intervals of increase are f prime x greater than zero. Decrease are similar, except f prime will be negative. So that's 
how you find intervals of increase and decrease. So step six is similar. You're going to find more intervals, but now we're going to go for concave up and concave down. Increase means go up to the right, decrease down to the right. So it's good to have little symbols so you remember what does it mean to be increasing, what does it mean to be decreasing. Concave up, it looks like a smile. Concave down, that's a frown. And of course this means F double prime greater than zero. That's concave up, concave down, F double prime less than zero. So step seven is where we finally start graphing. We're going to plot key points. Which is plot critical points, asymptotes. Actually, I shouldn't say plot key points. Plot key stuff. I don't have a better pronoun to put there. So critical points, asymptotes. Asymptotes. And also we want to find x, y intercepts. So those are things we've been finding forever. And step eight. Normally step eight was just take that information and draw a smooth curve from point to point. But now what we're going to do is use the increasing, decreasing, and concave up, concave down. We're going to sketch a much better curve. So we're going to use what we have in five and six to plot a more accurate curve. And we're going to use increasing, decreasing, and concavity. So those are the eight steps to graph. So basically, three, four, five, and six are the new things from calculus. You've done pretty much all these other steps before in pre-calculus. So what is new? 3, 4, 5, and 6, which lets us draw a much better curve for number 8. Not to mention we had no way to find critical points before, so we couldn't figure out where was local minimums and maximums occurring on a graph. So to save some time, we're going to just go ahead and redo, or not redo, but use this function right here and figure out all the steps we need for graphing. So we can avoid, or we've already done the critical points and classifying them. And we found the derivative and second derivative. So we're going to use this function right here and go ahead and graph it. Now, if I asked you to find the x-intercepts, how would you find x-intercepts of this function? So what do we set this equal to to find x-intercepts? Set equals 0, so I want to know when is y 0. But the problem is, how do you solve for x in degree 4? Easier said than done. You got rational zero theorem and divide by your factor that corresponds to your zero. Unfortunately, this polynomial does not have nice zeros. So I'm going to write down their approximate zeros. 
I picked, I made this polynomial so it has nice derivatives and critical points. So I didn't pick it because it has nice uh, x-intercepts. So given the x-intercepts, one point six comma zero and the other one will be three point eight comma zero so now we're going to go through all eight steps step one was domain so I had this written down on my notes here that I'm reading off of so I don't have to keep scrolling up and down so step one domain what is the domain of this function What's the domain of any polynomial? Yep, negative infinity, positive infinity. There's no dividing, there's no roots, so I don't have any, anything to worry about. What does this domain mean about vertical asymptotes? There is none. If you've got a vertical asymptote, there'll be at least an x value missing in your domain. So we got this domain. I could look for symmetry, but I'm going to skip that here. So identify any asymptotes or end behavior. So we'll just write down vertical. Polynomials have none. And then horizontal, which is also end behavior. We have to take limits, no matter what your function is, you're going to find limit when x goes to infinity, and then limit when x goes to negative infinity. Those are your two ends, your two end behaviors you have to look at. So there's our right end and our left end. So what happens when x gets really, really big in our function? So our x to the fourth term will be bigger than all the other terms. So that negative 4x cubed doesn't matter anymore. So what do we approach when x gets really, really big? We're going to approach positive infinity. What about x approaches negative infinity? Is it negative infinity? Positive. Why is it positive infinity, not negative? So our power is even. So if it's a huge negative number, it's going to be multiplied by itself four times. So it's going to be a huge positive number. If I had an odd power, that would be negative infinity. But our most powerful term is even. So that means we get positive infinity. All right, draw the cloud. We said up on both sides, so we know what the ends are going to look like. It's going to look like this. Step three, so we got the derivatives already. I'm just going to write them down here. 4x cubed minus 12x squared and f double prime 12x squared minus 24x step four find and classify critical points just going to copy down our work 110 and 3 negative 17 no 0 10 and 3, negative 17. Was 110 a min or a max? Or that was inflection. And the negative 17 was a min, local minimum. So normally I'd want to see all your work done, but all we did all that work above.
Step five, increasing, decreasing intervals. So let's go ahead and find just the increasing interval first, and then we'll worry about the decreasing interval afterwards. So this is f prime greater than 0. I got f prime written right here. How do I figure out when this inequality is true? I want to warn you, if you do algebra and you multiply by anything or divide by anything with an x in it, you have to be careful. That could be negative. And if it's negative, it's going to be hard to, uh, you'll have to figure out what conditions it's negative in and then flip your inequality sign when those conditions are happening. So you're going to have a very tough problem if you try to multiply or divide by any expression with x in it. So I recommend don't do that. How did we figure out polynomial inequalities back in pre-calculus? I could factor it out. That would be one option. How did we figure out more complicated inequalities? So we graphed the function and figured out when was it above the x-axis, when was it below the x-axis. So we can do that now. So to solve this, I'm going to let, well really, we already have a name for this, it's f prime of x. So the good news is I know when it equals 0. We've already done that work. So I'm going to graph f prime really quickly, and I'm going to do what's called a sine graph. I know it has two zeros. We computed those already. Zero and three. So it's going to be zero at zero and zero at three. So all I have to do is figure out, is it plus or minus in the other three regions? So this particular function, it's either going to be positive or negative. It can't be both. It can't be positive sometimes and negative other times, because it would need a x-intercept to go between the two. So we've identified the only two x-intercepts, so it's either positive or negative in between each of these. How do I figure out positive or negative? We'll go less than zero. So I can try negative one. So I'm making a choice. We'll go negative one. What is f prime of negative one? So looking over here, it's going to be negative four minus 12 is something but that something is negative. So we're going to be negative for this entire time. What's a good value between 0 and 3 to plug in? We'll go with positive 1. Doesn't it constantly every time? Like Some functions do. Positive, we'll get to that in a minute of other ways to figure this out. So what is uh, f prime of 1? I'm plugging in 1. We have 4 minus 12, also less than 0. So this one's not going to alternate every time. What about after 3? Let's try 4. f prime of 4. Now we have 4 to the 4th minus 3 times 4 times 4 squared. So we have 4 4 cubed times 4 minus 3, which is greater than 0. So we're positive over there. So when is f prime greater than 0? For all these x values, from 3 to infinity. And that's where it's going to be positive. So 3 to infinity. And you cannot include 3, because at 3, your derivative is 0, not positive. So I want to know not when is it equal to 0 and greater, but when is it only greater. So you should always have open intervals on your increasing and decreasing.
and decreasing. Decreasing are the other two intervals we didn't use, negative infinity to 0 and 0 to 3. Why was I not allowed to use 0? What is f prime of 0? At 0. So it's not actually increasing at 0. It's increasing all around 0, but it's not increasing at 0 itself. Now is there another way to figure out this graph? Absolutely. This is a happy, is it? No, it's not a happy parabola. If you look at it right here, I could factor out a 4x squared now you have to remember, back to pre-calculus class, I have a bounce x-axis intercept at 0, and I have a cross at 3. And you also have to know end behavior. So end behavior, if I graph this out really quickly, it goes bounce at 0, cross at 3. So if you wanted to graph the function, a really fast graph would look like this in green. And you can see negative, negative, positive. You can either sketch the graph with what you remember from pre-cal 1, or if you forgot pre-calculus 1, you just pick a value in each interval and plug it in. So it's up to you. You can either go back and remember bouncing and crossing, or plug in values. Either way, I need to see either these blue marks on the graph, or I need to see your really fast sketched graph right here. And Concavity is pretty much exactly the same, just a different inequality. So we'll do this one more time with concavity.